2. We read Luke chapter 2, the first 20 verses of the chapter. We hear God's word. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all the world went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go, even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God, for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them. We read God's word that far. May God bless his word to our hearts. We take as our text this morning the first seven verses, which we will not reread. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ, as we well know, is a marvelous event. An event in which we see the hand of God involved in so many different ways, in all of the various details that took place, that led to that marvelous event. It's true that we see God's hand in all the details of our lives, and we see God's hand in the conception and the birth of our own children. But we also understand the birth of Jesus Christ was a wonder. And the mystery of the Godhead was being revealed as God came into human flesh. We also acknowledge this event was pivotal in all history. All history serves this marvelous event. And we understand that simply even by the way in which the years are calculated. 2019 coming from that many years approximately after Jesus was born. But even more than that, we recognize the impact of this birth on the whole of the world. God ordained that wicked Caesar Augustus serve God's purpose so that the Bible would be fulfilled and Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And all the details surrounding that wonder ordered by God according to the program that had been laid out in the Old Testament so that as we go through the Old Testament, God already gave the entire program of all of the things that must come to pass. The ways in which Jesus' birth would be realized, the events that would take place, so that 
All the events as we read them in the accounts of Jesus' birth are fulfilling these various prophecies that had pointed to the way. And again, every detail demonstrating God's faithfulness, God's goodness, God's marvelous love. The wonder by which God promises and keeps those promises. And we look this morning at a number of the wonders surrounding the birth of Jesus as set forth here in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. We take as our theme the birth of Jesus Christ, noting first of all the fullness of time. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. Secondly, born in Bethlehem. And thirdly, born in poverty. It came to pass in those days, we read in verse 1, all the events of history were set in motion by a decree, a decree that came from Caesar Augustus, a wicked man, that all the world should be taxed. Now this is an astounding aspect of Jesus' birth in the sense that Jehovah God so ordains all the events that take place in such a way that a wicked man, Caesar Augustus would be the tool that God uses to bring about the salvation of his people. This wicked ruler would be the one who would bring about the means by which the Savior would come into the world. But at the same time, this wicked ruler would be the means by which condemnation then would come upon the world. As through this one, God would condemn and would judge the world. Caesar Augustus took the name Augustus, which meant highly regarded, full of majesty, a proud man, but merely a tool in God's hand to accomplish God's good pleasure. God had spoken in Micah 5, verse 2, that Jesus had to be born in Bethlehem. And now God uses Caesar Augustus to make that decree that would set in motion that which was necessary, that Jesus could be born in Bethlehem. We find marvelous comfort in this, beloved, as we think about the fact that God is so ruling all the events in the world around us to serve the wonder of our salvation. What a marvelous thought. The fact that Jehovah God is so ruling the president of our country, President Trump, but also the presidents, the prime ministers of all of the countries throughout all of the world. And that God is orchestrating it in such a way that all of them serve as tools in His hand to accomplish His good pleasure. What is God's great plan now? To send His Son in order to come to deliver this present world, to burn it with fire, and to bring His people into the fullness of glory. And now all of the events that are taking place in history today Tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, all by God serving that grand and glorious purpose. We see that with regard to the first coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And by faith we lay hold on that wonder also as it pertains to His second coming. Now there have been many attempts to try to undermine this history and to undermine the accuracy that is set forth here. This passage is not excluded from criticism. As we know, critics will analyze and try to pick apart various passages of Scripture to show that this isn't accurate. This is foolishness. Why would we follow something that isn't even historically accurate? We know for years the critics have undermined the virgin birth and the validity of the virgin birth. The Bible is clear. Jesus was born not just of a young woman, but... The Greek is very precise and specific. A woman who had no sexual relations with any man. A virgin. But there are other arguments that we want to look at this morning that seek to undermine the authority and the credibility of Scripture. The point is made by secular historians that we have no record of attacks during the time of Caesar Augustus. They claim that Cyrenius was not governor of Syria until eight years after the birth of Jesus. Note that in the parentheses of verse 2. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. How do we reconcile this? And how do we understand this? Again, critics latch hold of this and say, look, this is proof. The Bible's not accurate. 
It's not even historically accurate because Cyrenius was governor of Syria, not during this time, but some eight years later after Jesus is born. They dismiss then the Bible as foolishness, not worthy of being followed. We don't do that. By faith, we believe that God's word is infallible. It's inspired. It's God's word himself. And when we experience seeming contradictions from human reasoning or science, instead of questioning the word of God, we insist God's word is truthful. God's word is that which stands. And we cling to the truth of inspiration. But also then we seek to reconcile the history. And it's not difficult to reconcile the matter along this line. Notice that the decrees mentioned in verses 1 and 2 are separated by parentheses. The parentheses that are in verse 2. There is in the text itself a distinction between the decree and then the taxing. So we have in verse 1, the decree goes forth. And then parentheses. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor. So that the decree went out first in this way. It was a census that required that all the citizens of the kingdom had to be enrolled in the books. And so their names had to be jotted down. The property that they owned had to be noted. The income that they made. The word taxed in verse 1 literally means recorded. It's the same word that's used in Hebrews 12, verse 23, where we have the record of God with regard to the book of life. God records those who are in his book of life. So that the Roman census then took place first. And once that record was completed, once all the names were established, all the details were given, then the tax was able to be assessed and could begin to become, be collected. And we understand that would have been a tremendous progress process. It would have taken some time, a long time even, so that we understand then what's taking place is the decree goes out that they have to be enrolled. And that's now that to which Joseph and Mary are responding with a view to the taxation that would take place when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. It would take place down the road a bit. And it would probably be carried out over the course of a number of years. Joseph and Mary now then obey that Roman authority. And they go to Bethlehem in order to be recorded so that they can then be taxed. We read in verse 6, the days were accomplished. Now this reference isn't merely to the fact that nine months were up. And now the baby was about to be born. That's true. The days were accomplished with regard to her pregnancy. But it speaks broader than that. The days were accomplished speaks to, again, God's grand purpose with regard to the whole of the world and history. The fullness of time. God often speaks of that, uses that language, the fullness of time. Galatians 4, verse 4 confirms that. In the fullness of time, God sent His Son. Now that concept involves a lot to think about. In the fullness of time, God taking into consideration the point at which all things were ready for the coming of the Messiah and for the work that He would do. The state, the condition of Israel at this time, the state and condition of the church, noting the imminent collapse of the Old Testament types and shadows, all of that had to be brought to an end. Even though Israel had returned from captivity, they'd come back to their own land, there was still a lot that would never be the same. They had a temple, but the temple did not begin to match the glory of Solomon. They were able to enjoy a holy of holies, but the Ark of the Covenant was missing. The priesthood was not what it should have been. The high priest was really just a puppet of the Roman authority. The last prophet that spoke had been 400 years previous. The royal house of David was at a point where it was quite obvious no king would ever come out of this line again. 
And so God then brings things from a human perspective to a point where it would seem as though the coming of the Messiah was impossible. The Messiah is supposed to come from David. The situation has become so bad that there's no possibility really, it would seem, of a ruler, a king, coming out of the line of David. The hated tyrant on the throne was Herod. He was an Edomite. <coughs> and so God here is ordaining all things with that in view. And on the foreground in Luke 2 is not so much the state of the Jewish nation and her spirituality, but also the state of the world. Caesar Augustus makes a decree. And it's in the fullness of time now that God sends his son. What kind of a time was that? And you children are aware, we talk about this. In catechism and in school, no doubt. The fact that God brought it so that the civilized world was ruled by one ruler. One governor now controlled the whole known world. There was one language. Travel was good throughout the whole empire. The world was ready to answer this question. What do you think of the Christ? It was a time when God could send His Son and everyone would know about Him. They would know that He came. They couldn't miss it. They wouldn't be able to say, we don't know what you're talking about. We've never heard of the Christ. We've never heard about Him. Not only the Jews, but the whole world would reject the Messiah. And they would be left without an excuse. So that God sends His Son at the fullness of time when we would say the world was at the height of her achievements. She had attained tremendous levels. Man was proud at the point where man had accomplished things, had performed mighty works, and now man in his pride believed that they had control of the world and all the things that were taking place. The world was, in other words, at the point where it was ready for God's judgment. The world given over to sin, given over to the pursuit of the pride of man. The days were accomplished according to the inscrutable wisdom of God. Now was the time to send His Son in the fullness of time. Now, beloved, it's important that we see the application of that to us today. God came when the church as a whole had rejected Him. God came when there was yet a remnant that was hopeful, looking for the coming of the Messiah. God in His grace would continue to preserve that remnant, and He would watch over them. But for the most part, humanism, the worship of man, pride, the pursuit of the things of this life, characterized the world at that day. The world given over to the pursuit of her own glory, her own honor. Hopelessly lost in shame and sin and guilt. And beloved, all of this serves the purpose of God in this sense. Who would believe? Who would believe and lay hold on the fact that this is the Messiah? Who would believe that God in this time now has sent His Son? Faith would be required. It would only be by faith that one would be able to understand and know this is the Messiah. This is the one whom God has sent to deliver. The church must glory in the Lord, not in herself. From every earthly outward perspective, it seemed as though the church would never be able to survive. And the church would never be able to bring forth any wonder. And yet God does what is impossible in the eyes of men. And we know, beloved, that that's the anticipation with which we look forward to the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ again. The Bible talks about what will be necessary, what this world will look like, everything serving God's perfect plan, the darkness that will be characteristic of this world in terms of the apostasy, the church world forsaking, not looking anymore for the coming of a Messiah, living for the things of this light, living for an earthly kingdom, and for earthly honor and earthly fame. Jehovah God preparing all things for the coming of His church. Seemingly salvation impossible. The church will appear to be doomed. Our future bleak. And yet Jehovah God in control of all things, ordaining everything in order that the cup of iniquity be filled, and then He send His own Son in order to deliver His people 
from their sins. The church must glory in the Lord, not in herself. The church doesn't glory in her own ability, her advancements, her power, her might, her influence. The church glories in the Lord. And the truth that must be proclaimed is salvation is all of God. God is the one who will bring about deliverance. He's the one alone able to accomplish what man could never do. Jehovah God does that in the fullness of time. He sends His Son, born of a virgin, testifying salvation is all of God. But secondly, He's born in Bethlehem unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. The birthplace of Jesus had been prophesied, as we noted, in Micah 5, verse 2. And it was anticipated by the believing Jews. The more majority of the Jews didn't pay attention to the Scriptures. They didn't read the Bible. They weren't looking for the coming of the Messiah in Bethlehem. But even though the state of religion was bleak, there was a remnant that yet believed. And there was a remnant that understood and laid hold on those Old Testament prophecies. And they anticipated and they expected the coming of the Messiah from Bethlehem, the city of David. Joseph and Mary lived about as far from Bethlehem as you could in those days. They were from the far northern part of the kingdom, the city of Nazareth, found in Galilee. So there was Galilee, then there would be Samaria, then there would be Judea. Isaiah talks about a great light shining from the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. Those that were in darkness would see the shining of this great light. And so confident Isaiah was with regard to the coming of this light and the coming of the Messiah, that when Isaiah writes it, he uses what we call the prophetic perfect. He puts it in the present tense so that he speaks of the fact that I have seen a great light. The light has shone, implying that he's already experienced it. It's so real in his consciousness, and it's so real in the testimony that God has given that unto us a child is born. He's not talking about some future event that's going to take place merely. We know it will be future, but so real it is, and so confident he is that God has performed this wonder that he lays hold upon that reality. All were gone to the city of their fathers to register. And Joseph, now of the line of David, takes Mary, his wife, with him in order to go to Bethlehem to register. The question often is raised, why did Mary go with? Was it necessary, according to Caesar Augustus, for the wife to accompany the husband? Through all ages, that question's been asked. This was a long trip, four days of study travel in order to arrive. Plus, she's great with child, so that wouldn't it have been much better if she would have stayed behind? The answers to those questions can't with confidence be answered. Did God reveal to Joseph and Mary that she had to come along? They knew the babe had to be born in Bethlehem, and now, knowing that she was about ready to give birth, was that their plan anyway? Another factor, it seems, that God was working here was a desire of Joseph and Mary to move to Bethlehem so that later on in Matthew 2, verses 11 to 22, Joseph expresses his intent to come back out of Egypt in order to live in Judea and Bethlehem. But then God says to him, no, you need to go to Nazareth instead. So God, by a dream, says you need to avoid the wicked king that now is ruling in that area and you need to go to Nazareth. So that it could very well be possible too that they were intending to move in order that they would relocate and live now in this area. Nazareth was a city from which no good came. It had a bad reputation, but now they would relocate. But we know, regardless, it's Jehovah God ordaining this for the sake of the salvation of His church. And as Joseph and Mary come close to Bethlehem, eager anticipation must have set in. Mary had things to ponder as she's making the trip. She was given to know the amazing nature of her pregnancy. And she knew that this was a wonder. This was a wonder from God. How is all of this going to work out? 
She believed the words of the angel, but she still couldn't understand how everything would work. She couldn't understand how this baby would be the Messiah, the king, how this child that would be born would be the one who would save his people from their sins. How would he save them? What kind of a child would he be? What kind of impact would he have on their own lives? Mary is pondering these things in her heart. She's thinking through all of this as she nears Bethlehem. And she doesn't have all the answers. She's not knowledgeable of the way in which God is going to work this all out. But suddenly God readies all of history for this great event for the babe to be born in Bethlehem. And as they got close to Bethlehem, they would have seen the scene where Ruth and Naomi had gleaned so much history in this small town. Here's where Jesse and his seven stalwart sons had lived. This is where David had learned to be a shepherd, where he had learned and sung the Psalms, learned to sling stones to care for the sheep. From this city had come mighty warriors, Joab and Abishai. By the gate of the city was that famous well, the water of which David had longed for, and his soldiers had broke through at the cost almost of their lives in order to get that cup of water which, Jesus, which David then dumped out and would not drink. This was the city of David. This was the city of which Micah had prophesied concerning the ruler of Israel. He whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting, he who was God would come and would be born in this small town, this town of really no significance, Bethlehem. And so God ordaining all things now according to that perfect counsel and plan. And he would be born in Bethlehem in poverty and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The story of the birth of Jesus, as we're aware, is so simple that even our children enjoy hearing and telling the story. It's so simple that in order to put it in a book form or a movie form or to dramatize it, involves adding all kinds of extra details and all kinds of extra language that's not found in the passage. The astounding wonder and yet the simplicity of this event took place in a cattle stall in the small city of Bethlehem. God came to dwell with us in human flesh. The mystery of the Godhead revealed in all of its glory and all of its wonder here. And as we try to tell it, and as we bring other scripture passages in in order to extol the mystery of it, ultimately, the wonder of wonders is that the Lord of glory, the God of our salvation, came into human flesh and was made poor so that we could be made rich. He humbled himself in order that he might be exalted and that with his exaltation he might take us and exalt us. God come in flesh to fellowship with us, to dwell with us, to live with us eternally. And by faith we lay hold on that. We believe that wonder. Jehovah God came into human flesh to dwell with us and to live with us eternally in order that he might place His Spirit within us, and that we might know the wonder of salvation. Beloved, simple and yet profound, requiring faith to believe. And God works that faith by which we embrace the prophecy of Scripture. We believe the impossible. A virgin gave birth. God ordained all of these things for good. And by faith we lay hold upon that wonder as the wonder by which we know peace with God. Our sins have been forgiven. Jesus came to save his people from their sin. The manner of his birth hid from all those that didn't have faith to believe. God hiding that wonder in a number of ways. Striking ways. Hiding the wonder in the sense that Jesus is born in a cattle stall. Hiding the wonder in such a way that Jesus is born in poverty. He's not born in a fancy palace. He's a king who's born now in this 
stable and laid in a manger. Men and women were looking for a king. They were looking for the king of the Jews to come. The one who would do battle against the Romans and would defeat the Romans. They're not looking in a stable. They're not looking in a cattle stall. They're not looking in Bethlehem. They're not looking where God sent His own Son. The young couple comes to the inn. There's no room. They're pointed to the cattle stall next to the inn where the cattle of the passing caravans would be held for the night. The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, is born in such poverty. And He's wrapped not in blankets, but swaddling clothes, strips of cloth and rags. He doesn't have a nice crib in which to lay, but he's laid in a manger, likely one made of stone, a feeding trough. Now, beloved, there's something wonderful about this event. There's something marvelous about this wonder of wonders that causes the birth of Jesus to stand out from all the other wonders that God sent through history. If we just think about it in this regard, every other sign that the Bible gives us is set forth in the context of a divine wonder. There's a miracle. There's a power of grace that's evident. And it showed in a concrete way so that the divine power of God's grace breaks through this sin-cursed creation in order to show the glory and the majesty of God. For instance, think of during the time of Noah. God breaks through this sin-cursed creation and He sends the flood. Marvelous! A mighty event. A sign, a very public display of God's grace and God's power and God's judgment of this sin-cursed world. During the time of Moses, God sends the ten plagues. Mighty wonders that pointed to God's greatness, God's glory that all men witnessed and saw. Moses is standing before the burning bush and God sends fire from heaven to consume the bush without it even burning. During the time of Joshua, God causes the sun to stand still. He parts the Jordan River. God again intervenes into this creation with mighty wonders that display how great He is. They stand before the town of Jericho. How will this army conquer Jericho without the tools of war? God causes the walls to collapse and to fall down. God fighting their battles on their behalf, demonstrating His power his majesty, and his care for his church. During the time of Elijah, Elijah stands on Mount Carmel with all Israel. He calls fire down from heaven, and that fire consumes the sacrifice, burning up all the water. Again, powerfully demonstrating, Jehovah, he is God alone. Now, here in Bethlehem, God reveals the greatest wonder of all the most marvelous sign that he could ever give. But he does it in such a way that the wonder is hid from the human eye and from the natural eye. There's no fire. There's no flood. There's no wonders. There's no marvelous event that causes everybody to pause. A child is born. His flesh and his blood are dependent upon his mother, just like an ordinary child. He's wrapped in cloth. He needs to be changed. He needs to be fed, just like an ordinary baby. This glorious event ordained by God in even a more dramatic way to demonstrate faith is necessary. Faith was required to confess all of the wonders through history as from God and for God's glory. But the glorious revelation of divine grace shown in the manger in Bethlehem especially demonstrated that apart from faith, all is vain. It's a sign, and it's a sign not only from Isaiah 7, verse 14, but also the words of the shepherd here. This shall be a sign, verse 12, unto you. He shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. It's a sign from God, a marvelous sign from God, but given in a manner differently than God revealed the other signs through history. And it demonstrates the wonder by which God is testifying 
Salvation is of God alone. And God alone will work the faith by which His children will lay hold upon that wonder, confessing it to be their own and confessing their faith in that babe as their Lord and Savior. Now the manner of that birth reveals the absolute poverty into which Jesus came. He came with nothing. He received but the barest necessities, swaddling clothes and a place to sleep. He didn't come to dig deep roots. He didn't come to establish himself here on earth, to accumulate a pile of wealth here below. The purpose for which he came was to take on poverty as a sign of the fact that he has nothing in this world. The only thing that he has in the world is that which he makes his own. And that is his people and the hearts of his children. There's no room but for that which is appointed by God. And God makes room. God performs the wonder in the hearts of his children by which we believe. And we lay hold upon the coming of the Messiah. The world hates the light. The light shines and they run. They flee. They don't want their sin to be exposed. The children of God stand with joy and rejoicing. The light has shone. And with joy, we confess the guilt and the depravity of our sin. With joy, we confess the wonder of a Savior who's delivered us from that sin and depravity in order to bring us into the wonder of life everlasting. He who came to fight the battle for our redemption. We have nothing to give Him. We have no desires that are not already His. We see through the humble birth of the babe in Bethlehem, the Lord of glory. And we see the poverty and the earthly trappings of the one who is poor in order that we might be made rich. And the wealth that we seek is not that which is here below, but that which is to come, that which is spiritual and heavenly. Beloved, by faith we confess the birth of our Lord and Savior as a wonder of God's grace. And we thank God for the faith by which He's worked in our hearts to lay hold on that babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The one who broke us free from the shackles of sin and death and the one through whom we live unto Him. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank Thee for a Savior who is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we thank Thee for the wonder by which Thou hast worked faith in our hearts to believe that which is humanly impossible. And we rejoice in that wondrous gift by which we are able to know Thou art great and greatly to be praised. And Thou hast given unto us a Savior who has delivered us from the guilt and shame of our sin. A Savior who has given unto us peace with Thee. And grant that we might enjoy also as fellow saints, that peace one with another. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.